So, if we were on one of those guess the word type game shows and the person giving the clue said, equations, the guesser would most likely quickly blurt out, mathematics, physics. The bell would ding and they'd be off to the next word. We associate science, especially physics, with mathematics. So close is the relation that we now speak in terms of the acronym STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. There are wonderful pop science books that explain the most famous equations in the history of physics. Physics and mathematics are thought of as inextricably intertwined. Now, this was not always the case. It really was only in the 1700s that we started to see what we would now think of as mathematical physics. Before that, physics read like philosophy, because it was. There were some limited applications of mathematics to nature before that. It was largely in astronomy. The classical Greeks, and especially the Muslim astronomers of the Middle Ages, who developed spherical trigonometry, used quite sophisticated mathematical techniques to be able to predict the movements of the heavenly bodies. But aside from that, there really was no mathematics anywhere in physics. The person who started to change that was Galileo. He developed an equation for bodies in gravitational freefall. x equals minus one-half gt squared minus vt minus x. Specify how high up they are and what their initial velocity was. Then, given Galileo's equation, we could specify where the body was at any time during the fall. It was an incredible advance, but it was limited. It only worked for bodies falling in a straight line. Shoot a cannonball or kick a football, and the case became too complicated, even though these are fairly simple cases. The problem was that we didn't have powerful enough mathematics. That changed with René Descartes' analytic geometry. Prior to Descartes, it was thought that there were two distinct branches of mathematics. Number theory, algebra, arithmetic, and the like, that dealt with quantitative matters. And then there was geometry that dealt with more qualitative shapes in space. But Descartes figured out that through what we now know of as graphing, we could develop a translation dictionary between geometry and algebra. We could talk about the equations of lines, parabolas, and circles. This opened the door to mathematically modeling more complex matters like trajectories. But it wasn't powerful enough. To do the job, we needed a new system that had more oomph, a technical term. This was provided in the next generation by Isaac Newton with his theory of fluxions, or as we now call it, calculus. With the calculus, physics could become fully mathematized. So successful was this project that most of us don't even pause to think about how incredible it is. But then, most of us are not Eugene Huygner. Born in Budapest in 1902, Huygner studied both mathematics and physics. Indeed, he was one of the individuals who brought cutting-edge mathematical theory into physics when quantum mechanics was raising difficult questions about the nature of the atom. He was the assistant to David Hilbert, the most important figure in turn-of-the-century mathematics, whom we'll discuss later on in this lecture, and as a result of his early mathematical work introduced group theory and the notion of symmetry into the study of elementary particles. Today, this is one of the central concepts. For this work, he received the Nobel Prize in 1963. He left Europe in 1930, just before the Second World War, and during the war, was the person who brought fellow Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard out to a vacation house on Long Island where Einstein was staying, a meeting which led to Einstein's letter to President Roosevelt and the start of the Manhattan Project. In 1960, Wigner wrote a famous piece entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. In it, he sets out the issue. The first point is that the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious, and that there is no rational explanation for it. Math works incredibly well in allowing us to come up with unexpected predictions, and they almost always turn out right. 
it seems miraculous. What is it about mathematics that allows this to happen? To see how strange this is, Wigner has to explain to us exactly what mathematics and physics are and how they're completely different projects. He explains mathematics with a funny dig at philosophy. Someone once said that philosophy is the misuse of terminology which was invented just for this purpose. In the same vein, I would say that mathematics is the science of skillful operations with concepts and rules invented just for this purpose. So, philosophy and mathematics are similar in that they're completely self-contained conceptual games. Both philosophers and mathematicians invent concepts, invent rules that govern the playing of the game with the concepts, and then go on to play. Mathematics may have started with concepts from the world, counting our fingers and such. But if you look at the work of actual mathematicians, their concepts are so derivative and abstract that they have no intrinsic connection to anything in the world. You can't build a bridge negative four feet long. Negative numbers are not suggested by the world. Maybe debts, you're broke, but you owe me $5, so you could have negative $5. But we can add things. That's just putting more together, right? That's something in the world. You could do it over and over again. That gets us to multiplication. You could multiply things by themselves. That gets us to squaring. And that seems to give rise to an inverse operation, square root. But now, we're to something that's in no way suggested by anything in the world. Put square roots with negative numbers together, and you get numbers that are absolutely in no way connected to any empirical experience. Imaginary numbers. Yet, there's an intricate mathematical study of imaginary, or as they call them, complex numbers. Why do mathematicians engage in studies of complex analysis? Because they're mathematicians. That's what they do. That's the game they love to play for no other reason than it's a fun game for them. I've often compared mathematics to Dungeons and Dragons. Mathematicians create imaginary worlds for themselves for the sole purpose of seeing what would happen in that imaginary world. But here's the weird thing. There are theories in physics, say quantum mechanics, that seem to necessarily make use of imaginary numbers. These concepts were just part of a game about a made-up conceptual world. How in the world do the concepts of that imaginary world play a necessary role in accounting for the behavior of real things in this world? Max Tegmark, a physics professor at MIT, has proposed one answer. Wigner argued that there's no rational explanation for the ability of mathematics to explain the physical world. Tegmark suggests that an obvious rational explanation is that the world is a mathematical system. I've been fortunate to have one interesting intellectual interaction with Professor Tegmark, and it just happens to involve this topic. In relativity theory, we'll see that space and time get combined into a single entity, space-time. In the equation that shows this to us, the distinction between the spatial and the temporal dimensions is indicated by a minus sign. The three spatial dimensions are negative, and the time dimension is positive. But I realized we could do the physics just as well if one of the negatives were changed into a positive. But this would mean we'd have a universe which was a flat surface with two times. What would that mean? What would that even look like? I played with the equation and came up with odd results and started to try to think through conceptually what it would mean to be early in one direction and late in another to a dinner party in this flat world. I posed this question to my old professor from my general relativity course in graduate school. He was baffled too. He said, I know just the person to ask and sent the question to Professor Tagmark. His response was to express the same playful confusion that we were working through. But he took the question seriously because, as we will see, he takes the meaning of the mathematics very seriously. He gives an argument reminiscent of that 
given by the 20th century Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein in his early thought. Wittgenstein's first book, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, a title he did not select and personally despised, was written while Wittgenstein was in a prisoner of war camp during World War I. He was an ambulance driver, taking wounded soldiers from the front to the hospital when he was captured. During this time, he wrote a manuscript that he mailed from a POW camp to Bertrand Russell, who was also in prison, but this was in a British jail, guilty of refusing military service because he was a pacifist. This became one of the most important works of the 20th century. In the manuscript, Wittgenstein argued that the reason logic works is that there's a correlation between the internal structure of the relations that make up reality and the internal structure inherent in our logic. The logic inherent in our language mirrors the internal structure of the world we use it to describe. Professor Tegmark makes a similar move with physical theory and the mathematical language in which it's couched. Tegmark considers two hypotheses. The first is what he calls the external reality hypothesis, or the ERH. This asserts there exists an external physical reality completely independent of us humans. In other words, there's a universe. Humans are in it. Humans have experiences of it. But what it is we have experiences of is something independent of us and our experiences. If I look and see a chair, it's because there's a chair for me to see. This seems common sense enough and is widely shared by most physicists. Now, there are some physicists, those who buy into the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, something we'll deal with later, and some philosophers, those we term metaphysical idealists, who reject this, but they're a small minority. The, the, the technical term for such people is weirdos. Our theories are comprised of two parts. One part is strictly mathematical content that seeks to describe the world as it is. But mixed in with it is what he terms baggage. That is, aspects that we use to connect this formalism to our experiences. The baggage in our theory is the parts that refer to human experience and the goal of real science is to ultimately produce a theory that's stripped of all of this baggage. To do so would be to validate the second hypothesis, the mathematical universe hypothesis, or MUH, which asserts our external reality is a mathematical structure. There are three parts to this statement. External reality is just that which comes from the external reality hypothesis. A mathematical structure is a baggage-free system of abstract concepts in a specified system of relations. The third part of the hypothesis is the single word is. Not to be Bill Clinton, but to fully understand the mathematical universe hypothesis, it depends on what the word is means. There are different meanings of is. There's the is of predication. When I say that I am hungry, then I'm saying that hunger is a property of Steve. That's different from the is of identity. When I say that I am Steve, I'm saying that the words I and Steve refer to the same object, me. The is of the mathematical universe hypothesis is the is of identity. But the notion of identity is a specific type, mathematical identity. Two mathematical structures are identical if you can map them onto and into each other, if there is what mathematicians call an isomorphism. Since mathematics is a language of bare relationships, if two systems are different ways of describing the same relationships, then they're different ways of saying the same thing. And thus, the two structures are to be deemed the same structure. There are two different ways we do science. One is starting with our baggage. That is, we look around the world, see what's happening, and come up with theories to explain it. This is the science of the frog in the bog. But as we get better and better theories, we can start to strip out the baggage, leaving more and more pure, abstract mathematical theories. These baggageless versions 
are the science of the bird soaring above the bog, looking down in it from outside. Tegmark argues that if science is successful, that is, if it begins with the frog consciousness and ultimately arrives at a pure abstract consequence of our bird brains, then what science will have done is create a mathematical system that is isomorphic to the world it describes. This means that the world is the mathematical system. So why does mathematics work so well in physics? Because physics is describing a world that is itself a mathematical system. Anything other than math is just the baggage of a bunch of mere SASs, that is, self-aware systems. You know, people. A similar but distinct explanation came from two of the biggest names in 20th century philosophy, Willard Van Orman Quine and Hilary Putnam. The two were colleagues and dear friends in the philosophy department at Harvard for decades, despite being very different individuals. Both rose to prominence after the fall of logical positivism. Recall that logical positivism is the start of modern philosophy of physics and is based on four pillars. One, a criterion of cognitive significance that allows us to determine which sentences say something meaningful and which are just intelligent sounding nonsense. Two, the analytic synthetic distinction, which divides the meaningful propositions into those that are necessary truths from those that are contingent truths. Three, a theory of analytic truths, that is, a philosophy of math. And four, a theory of contingent truths, that is, a philosophy of science. Quine held the record for the fastest PhD in the history of Harvard, two years. He traveled to Europe, where he was the only American invited to sit in on the meetings of the Vienna Circle, the group of logical positivists. Putnam also had a connection with the logical positivists. The leaders of the Viennese and Berlin circles were Rudolf Carnap and Hans Reichenbach. Putnam studied with Reichenbach at UCLA, and Carnap would later introduce Putnam to the person who would become his wife, Ruth Anna Putnam, a major figure in philosophy in her own right. Quine and Putnam represent major figures in the development of philosophy in general, and philosophy of physics in particular, in the generation following the fall of logical positivism. Indeed, they were among those who brought that fall about. One of Quine's most famous works is a paper entitled Two Dogmas of Empiricism. By empiricism, he means logical positivism. The first of the two dogmas is reductionism, that we can reduce all true propositions to a combination of logic and sense perception. This was the heart of the first pillar of logical positivism, the criterion of cognitive significance. The second dogma is the analytic synthetic distinction. It's this second one that receives the most attention in the article and the one which Quine undermines. Recall that the analytic synthetic distinction separates meaningful sentences into two different classes. There are necessary truths, sentences whose negations are contradictions, and there are contingent truths, sentences whose negations are still possible. The sentence, I have a brother, is true. I do have a brother. But it doesn't have to be. It might have been the case that I didn't. I have a brother is synthetic. You need to know more than just the meanings of the words making up that sentence to know whether it's true or not. The sentence, I have a brother or I don't have a brother, is also true. But it's a different kind of truth. It has to be true. It's true no matter how the world is. If I have a brother, it's true. If I don't have a brother, it's true. It's a necessary truth. The truths of mathematics are supposed to be of this sort. But Quine shows that there's no clean way to draw this line. We could consider the mathematics to be analytic, to be necessary. That leaves our scientific beliefs underdetermined. But they would be synthetic. But, he argues, we could declare absolute belief in certain possible laws of physics. We could declare them to be necessarily true. Doing so is possible, but then the sentences of mathematics become contingent. 
The web as a whole is confirmed by our experience, Quine argues, but then it's up to us which strands of the web we declare to be analytic and which to be synthetic. That is, which parts are true by definition and which parts are contingent facts of the world. Based on this picture, our two figures developed what has come to be known as the Quine-Putnam indispensability thesis, which concludes that numbers exist as objects in the world just as much as atoms. The logical positivists had an allergy to metaphysics. They wanted a universe as scarcely populated as possible. If you didn't have observable evidence for the existence of something, it was not a thing. Mathematical concepts surely were not things. Math, they held, was a language, the language of physics. It provided the grammatical structure. That's all. Take the equation E equals MC squared. In it, there are three kinds of symbols. The M and the C are measurable quantities and as such represent things. The E is not directly measurable, but is defined in terms of measurables and so is a theoretical term. It doesn't refer to something in the world, but is reducible to the observables that do exist. Then there's the equal sign and the exponent two. These are non-referring terms. They don't point to anything in reality, just give us the linguistic structure needed to say things about things in reality. But this picture hinges on a working in absolute analytic synthetic distinction. Once that's gone, we have to ask anew, what do the equations of physics tell us exists in the universe? Quine and Putnam argue that whatever is indispensable in our best physical theories ought to be held to exist. Consider two theories about a fluorescent light. Theory one says that when I flip the switch, a circuit is closed, current flows through the wire, builds up on one of the plates inside the fluorescent bulb, making it more negative. The charge inside excites the gas inside, which, when it de-excites, gives off light. Now, consider a second theory. When the switch is flipped, it causes a lever with a tiny little boot to kick an invisible leprechaun in the backside. The leprechaun runs through the wire, carrying the negative charge, stacking it on the one plate in the bulb, and we get light from the excitement and de-excitement of the gas it contains. Now, similar theories, confirmed by the same evidence. Does that mean we have scientific evidence for leprechauns? No. The fun part of the second theory is dispensable. We can get rid of it and still have the same theory. So we don't really have physical evidence for leprechauns. But the electrons that generate the negative charge are different. They are indispensable. Without them, the theory can't work. So, the confirmation of our best physical theories gives us reason to believe in electrons, but not in leprechauns. We can't see electrons, atoms, or other entities posited by our best physical theories. But Quine and Putnam argue we should believe in all and only the ones that are indispensable to their ability to do what they do, which is account for what we see. The leprechaun is dispensable. The electrons aren't. And you know what else isn't dispensable? The mathematical terms. Math is indispensable in physics. By our criterion, then, we should assert the existence of numbers, sets, functions. All our mathematical notions need to be considered to be real things in the universe. Numbers exist, they contend, just as much as atoms. Our physics demands it. No longer is math just a grammatical tool. It must be held to be descriptive of aspects of the universe itself. Numbers are not mere intellectual tools. They are things unto themselves. In the philosophy of mathematics, we have two contrasting views. The realists or Platonists 
take numbers to be metaphysically existing objects. The nominalists take numbers to just be terms, empty names. By doing away with the difference between synthetic truths and analytic truths, and using the indispensability criterion for positing reasonable belief in the existence of something, Quine and Putnam have argued that physics forces us to be mathematical realists. We can only have atoms as real things if we also have numbers as real things. Now, naturally, there are philosophers who object. The most notable objection to Quine and Putnam on this matter is that of Hartree Field. Professor Field earned his PhD at Harvard, writing under, wait for it, Hilary Putnam. He's currently the Silver Professor of Philosophy at New York University. For us, his most important work is his first book, simply titled Science Without Numbers. And the point of the book is to do exactly what the title says. Field wants to be able to reconstruct physics in a way that does not make use of numbers. He's not saying that numbers aren't useful in physics. Of course they are. But the Quine-Putnam argument says more than that they're useful. It hinges on the claim that mathematical machinery is indispensable. Think back to our argument about electrons and leprechauns. We have good reason to believe in electrons, but not leprechauns, on the basis of empirical evidence, because our best theory cannot do without electrons, but sadly, can do without leprechauns. The criterion for positing the metaphysical existence of a thing is that it's indispensable for our best current theories of physics. So, if one were to undermine the view that physical theories tell us that there are not just electrons in the world, but also numbers as things, not just grammatical formalism, one approach is to try to completely reconstruct our best physical theories in a way that does without the mathematics. This, of course, is a huge project. What Field does is take a prominent corner of it. He argues that if he can do it with Isaac Newton's theory of mechanics and gravitation, that should be demonstration enough that it can be done more generally. He admits that his formulation is so technically cumbersome that it'll be unusable from any practical standpoint. He does not deny that mathematical formulations are far superior and allow us to do what we need to do with the theory. But remember the point. Quine and Putnam make the claim that mathematics is indispensable. It's merely a matter of principle. The place he starts in his move to eliminate mathematics is with the work of a mathematician, David Hilbert. Hilbert was one of the great geniuses and great characters in intellectual history. Indeed, if you want a great read, one of my favorite books ever is written by the historian Constance Reed. It's her biography simply entitled Hilbert. Coming from Königsberg, an area that used to be part of Germany, but is now part of Russia, Hilbert's accent and manner struck urbane German intellectuals as that of a country bumpkin. But in Königsberg, Hilbert had a great teacher, Adolf Hurwitz, and a fellow student who was also a genius, Hermann Minkowski. The three would take long walks every day, pondering the deepest questions across the entire breadth of the mathematical world. This left Hilbert with an instinct to think about mathematics from its foundations. One of the things he did was to think about Euclidean geometry. Euclid's work is a masterpiece of rigor, but mathematicians had long known that there were a few flaws in that diamond. Euclid had made use of a few assumptions he hadn't made explicit and a couple of logical leaps that were not quite kosher. Hilbert would fix it. Hilbert wrote Foundations of Geometry in which he re-axiomatized Euclidean geometry. Interestingly, though, he didn't start where Euclid did. Euclid begins with definitions. He wants his geometric terms like point, line, and plane to have clear geometric meanings. A point is that which has no part, like a bad actor at auditions. Hilbert, on the other hand, defines nothing. For him, mathematics is not about meaning, but about relations, logical relations. 
His geometry would just be the complete set of logical relations among undefined basic terms needed to derive the sentences of the form of all the consequences of Euclidean geometry. Just structure, no meaning. There are no points, lines, or planes in his geometric universe, just a set of rigorously set out logical relations among concepts. As Hilbert famously put it, instead of point, line, and plane, one must always be able to say table, chair, and beer mug. One can see why this approach would be attractive to field. If he could do to physics what Hilbert did to Euclidean geometry, he wins the game. Hilbert succeeded in reducing geometry to its logical core, not making essential use of any of the notions that represent things. The goal for Field is to create a purely logical set of relations that give us Newtonian mechanics and gravitation. But it was not just Hilbert's approach that was useful. Hilbert's work was a logical account of Euclidean space. Euclidean space just happens to be exactly what Newton uses as real space. So, Field can usurp Hilbert's axiomatization as his own starting point. Or, perhaps better said, as his starting space. Hilbert provides us with relations like congruent and between. For Field, this is the key to his project, because they're non-numerical ways of expressing things we usually use numbers for. Consider Euclid's original proposition concerning right angles. We would probably say something like, any angle that's 90 degrees is a right angle. In other words, we'd use numbers to define what a right angle is and say they're all of equal angularity. But Euclid simply posits that all right angles are equal to each other. No numbers. Same thing with lengths. To say that two things are congruent, that is, of equal length, what we would do is first measure one, then measure the other, and then compare the numbers. But congruence is not a relation between numbers. It's a relation among line segments. Hilbert realized that we don't need a measurement regimen, only the logical relationship of congruence. Equal length without numbers. They give us enough that we can use them to generate the numerical relations by ordering things in terms of not congruent and between, but those numerical relations are not themselves necessary. Field adopts this posture and set of relations as his starting point. From Hilbert's axiomatization of Euclidean geometry, Field continues to build upon it using logical tools that he very carefully selects so as to be able to do what Hilbert did. The details are too technical to get into, and there are a few places where the details are a little schematic, as Field himself admits, but the point is he does an incredible job constructing something that does seem to do what one would need in order to sketch the outline of what Newton's theory does, and does it all without numerical equations. Now, some buy into Field's project, others do not. But if it's successful, what it does is to say that numbers are not indispensable. If that's correct, it doesn't answer the question we started with. Indeed, exactly the opposite. It reopens the question. Recall that the question we are asking is Wigner's question about the eerie way that mathematics applies so perfectly to the natural world. Why is that? Is it, as Max Tegmark claims, because the world is in fact a mathematical system? Is it, as Quine and Putnam argue, because just like atoms are part of our world, so too is the mathematical machinery on which we base our physical theories? Is it because mathematics is a language that represents patterns, any pattern? And if we look hard enough at any system, we'll find a pattern, so it's trivial that mathematics works. I mean, if it didn't, we would just create a new mathematical system that would. On this line, it would be like being amazed that everything around us has a word that functions as its name. And if something's unnamed, we just come up with a new name for it. Of course, that picture doesn't allow for the ability of mathematics to provide us with predictions. Predictions that strangely seem to keep coming true. 
predictions like there will be another lecture in this series. Is that true? My calculations say, I'll see you then.